Let's my mouth for the meditation of each and every one of our hearts. We pray, will please God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Julian Raven was arrested and thrown in prison this past Tuesday for praying in public at a public park in Elmira, New York. And he's currently serving a nine-day sentence for disrupting the public. Wednesday a week ago, a small seven-member house church in Gilbert, Arizona, was told by the township that they were not allowed to meet in their homes for worship. They were not allowed to do any church activities, no Bible studies or anything, in their private homes because they were not zoned correctly for worship. Last September, in a middle school, Crossroads Middle School, at a place that you might know in New Cumberland, just south of Harrisburg, a junior high student was told that the shirt that they were wearing was inappropriate and were forced to wear their shirt inside out. The shirt read, abortion is not health care. I can remember growing up hearing a lot of sermons about the coming persecution of our society, about the fact that we would be persecuted for our faith if we stood firm for what we believed in Jesus Christ, and that our society would reject us and would, in fact, turn against us. I believe that then, and I think that today, we are seeing the beginning of this persecution. We are experiencing the beginning. Nurses, beware. If you pray with or for your patients or for your fellow staff, you may be getting a notice from your supervisor. Teachers. Watch out. If you are open openly, or if you are open about your faith in Jesus Christ, you may be standing before the school board or may be called to the principal's office. People who work in an office building, who read your Bible at lunch, or say a prayer over your grace, over your meal, be careful. You never know when somebody is watching you who might report you or be offended by your actions. We're facing the beginning of persecutions today. If you were to sit down and write a letter to one of these people, if you were to sit down and write a letter to the man who sits in prison today because of praying in public, what would you tell him? What would you say to him? What would you include in your letter? If you wanted to write a letter to the junior high student who was forced to turn their t-shirt inside out, or their worldview, whose First Amendment rights were trampled upon, what would you include in your letter? What sorts of encouragement, or what sorts of empowerment or strengthening, or what would you write to a person in this situation? This is the exact question that Mark was asking himself when he sat down to write his gospel. So you see, the people in Rome to whom Mark was writing, were at the verge of persecution. It hadn't yet broken out to its fullest extent, but they were feeling the very beginning ripples of what was coming. They were feeling the tensions rising. They were feeling the people start to do things. They were seeing the government start to make policies that would limit and affect their worship. They knew it was coming and that it was a matter of time. Mark said to himself, what should I write to these people? who are on the verge of persecution, who will inevitably face it. How can I strengthen their faith for this time ahead? And the answer is in this gospel. As we read through Mark, we find certain themes that are repeating and that are amplified, that are focused, that are focused upon. And it comes back to again and again certain words and phrases that are repeated. And today is Palm Sunday, and as I said, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so what I want to do with you today is take a section of Mark's Gospel that will tie together the day that it is today with the action 
that we are going to be taking in a few minutes. I want to tie Palm Sunday to Maundy Thursday, the Last Supper. And I want to look at the events over those five days with you really briefly. Just scan over those events and see what it can tell us about what it is that Mark would write to people in our situation. Because we too face persecution. The beginning of persecution. And I think that Mark has a message for us that will help us as we enter into this time of persecution. I want to invite you, it's going to help you if you follow along in your few Bibles, to turn to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and we down on page 823 in your few Bibles. Will not be on the overhead. We're not going to read all of these verses and all of these chapters. The primary things I may be pointing out a few words to you as we go along, and I'll be pointing out the, the headings and some of the content. We'll be talking about the content of these passages. But for time's sake, we're just going to be skimming over a lot of these to pick up some of the themes that Mark is tying into. And our passage today starts with the triumphal entry of Jesus as he's coming into Jerusalem. And you know, you've seen the picture, you've heard the words today as the scripture has been read to you. The palm branches are shaking, the coats are thrown out in front of Jesus as he's coming into the holy city. And what is it that they're shouting? Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to God. Hosanna to the son of David. Mark is establishing here in chapter 11 the identity of Christ for his listeners. He's saying that Jesus is the son of David. Why is that important? He's not the biological son, but the great-great-grandson, the descendant of David would be a better way of putting this. But the son of David, David is the king. The son of David has royal blood. He has a claim, a legitimate claim to the throne of David. This is David's son. The heir of the throne is what they're saying. This is why the Pharisees are getting so upset. Because the people, basically what they're saying is this guy could be our king. And they're inviting Jesus to do just that. And the Pharisees, and the Herodians in particular, who support Roman uh, imperialism, the, the, uh, the Roman soldiers, they want them there, say, hey, you've got to stop all this shouting son of David. Somebody might get the wrong idea and come in and ruin this good thing that we have going. But Jesus says, they know who I am. And if they don't cry out, the stones will cry out in their place. And so David is the legitimate heir to the throne, which is, by the way, messianic, having to do with the Messiah. The Messiah, the one that God has anointed, chosen for a special purpose that we're going to talk about here in a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. This leads into, it's very interesting, if you read this passage and then you get to the end, Jesus comes in, there's all this fanfare, the trumpets are blowing, the people are shouting, the branches are waving, the coats are thrown, everything is happening, and he gets into the city, and what does he do when he gets to the city? Did you ever notice the end of that passage? He walks in, he looks around, it's late in the day, so he leaves. He doesn't do a blessed thing. He leaves. Isn't that amazing? It's so anticlimactic. All the fanfare, all the buildup, for what? It's just for Christ. It's who he is. He's not about to do anything. He's not leading into anything. He goes home and goes to bed. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. And then the next day, he comes back to the city. So now we're on Monday. You can follow the days. If you just, if you just as we read along, you can follow. You can tell what day it is. Monday, he comes back. And this section, this passage has always bothered me. He goes to the fig tree. He sees the fig tree over there. He says, hmm, I'm kind of hungry. He walks over the fig tree. And the Bible says, it's not yet, in, it's not yet the season for figs. Verse 13. And Jesus gets there when the, it's not yet the season for figs, and there's no figs on the tree. He says, hmm, you don't tree? May you never bear fruit again. 
Now, the story's going to 